The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant good evening to you wherever you may be. You're listening to Comfortably Zoned Radio, and this is the 50s. When bums and gents walk the streets of New York, my name is Peter Trunk, and with me, as always, is Ralph Tycho and Ron Rabinovitz. Ralph, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you, Peter, and how are you, Ronnie? I'm great. Thank you. How are you, Peter? We're all good. We're all good. We're all good. We're all good. We're here. We're okay. talking at... We're talking off air a little bit about heroes. Yeah. And um, why don't you pick up on that, Peter? Because uh, one of my okay. anti heroes uh, passed away today. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Louis <laughs> Grant, um, who was the uh, father or grandfather of evangelism. And for that reason, uh, I've got a. Uh, I gotta hop in my step today and it's spring training. Um, but Ralph, Ralph, come on, come on, come on. Wait a minute. I, I know, it. I know. I should I get uh, it. An old but, man should not put a hop in his step because you could pull a muscle, you could have a coronary. <laughs> don't have a hop, then the man dies who uh, he was a despicable human. He was a, a friend of, of Nixon. He he was everything um, that a good anti-Semitic would um, would worship. So you can imagine that today is a special day. And uh, not just that. Like I say, spring training is starting. Um, I'm alive uh, for another day. We all, the three of us are, which is it's all a bonus when you're 70. Um, so, yeah, that's how my day is going. Ronnie, how about, how about you? How's your day going? My day's been good. My day's been good. And I'm 72, so. Oh, so <laughs> definitely don't, don't hop at 72. If you oh, don't hop at 70, yeah. you're yeah. not going to. No. Not going to suddenly be hopping. Um, now, wait a I minute. Just time down. out. Time out, you guys. Time out. Mick Jagger's 74, 75. He's got to hop in I his know. step. Are we talking oh, yeah. literal hop in your step, or are we talking figurative <laughs> hop in your step? You know, the, the truth of the matter is I have both. I'm lucky enough to, um, <laughs> to be 70 and um, and figuratively more so maybe than, <laughs> than, than physically, <laughs> but uh, I still every now and again break out in, into uh, – uh, a wild dance. <laughs> I'm cool. Give it a jump. A wild dance. I like to see that. A uh, wild dance. I'll give it a Hava Nagila and a Hava Nagila. Um, Here I go. I got um, my hand is on my head. All right, guys. Let's talk about heroes. Peter brought heroes. Up. Heroes. The funny Very thing about my heroes, I've had many heroes throughout my life and continue to have them. At age 71. But the funny thing about me is that, you know, when people used to ask me, what, who were your heroes when you were, like, in the first grade or second grade or third grade or whatever, when you were very young, I didn't have any heroes. I can't remember anybody, any person uh, who, uh, who could be categorized as a hero of mine until I got much older. I had heroes like um, stupid heroes, Duke Snyder. You know, I mean, you know, but when I say stupid heroes, I mean, like, you know, I was collecting bubblegum cards, and I wore my Brooklyn Dodger hat, and I watched the Dodgers on TV, and I listened to them on the radio, and one of my heroes was Duke Snyder. Well, that's not really going to help me in later life. Who, who did, who, you know, as I got older, I, I learned more about the world, and in doing so, I, uh, a lot of authors, why is that, Ralph? And, Ronnie, a lot of authors became my heroes, quote-unquote heroes. I started to read, and I started to, you know, like I would read a book. Let's say I would read a book, and I don't know if this happens to you. It should, and you'll probably say, of course it happened to me. But I would read a book, and if I liked it, I would say, what other stuff did this person write? Let me go to the library and look. You know, this was before the Internet, and – 
and see what other books he or she has written, and maybe I'll enjoy them too. So it was like more than just the book. And then it became, you know, I'd read a second book or a third book, and all of a sudden that author was one of my heroes or heroines. And if they were interviewed on Dick Cavett or, you know, probably not Johnny Carson. I'm not putting Johnny Carson down in any way, shape, or form, but more cerebral like uh, the Dick Cavett show or David mm-hmm. Susskind or, or, even William, or even William Buckley. And they would be interviewed on these shows, and I would watch, and I would say, wow, just what I thought they would say about that. And just what I thought their their stand would be on that subject, and it would it would mesmerize me. So when I became like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and twenty, then I had heroes, yeah, and a lot of them were authors. Hmm, interesting. You know, John yeah. Updike comes to mind when you mention that. When I was a kid, I read. I think it was Rabbit Run, and I couldn't put it down. I finished it and. Uh, spent the rest of my life looking for for more of his his stuff. So I well, know his follow up on that ra- ra- uh, Rabbit Redu, Absolutely. Rabbit Reddick, yeah, <laughs> Rabbit Reddick, and <laughs> um, and that book taught me a lot. But you know something? You mentioned having a hero as a sports figure as a kid, and it's yeah. not really a hero. This or that uh, Ronnie had a, a hero as a sports. Uh, as a, okay. as a kid, and he was a sports figure, and ironically, he picked the one that if you're going to have a hero, you don't you don't have to be a baseball fan to have Jackie Robinson True. True. as right. a hero. Right. right. So, um, yeah. well, see, if you want to review Ronnie, a little Ronnie, bit of Ronnie how your blessed. heroism first yeah. got started with uh, how your feeling of heroism got started with Jackie. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's it's interesting. As a kid, I mean, with Jackie, I mean, I loved him because he was helping my Dodgers win tennis. But I think the heroism of it came later. Um, you know, at first I, he was my, I don't know if he was my hero. He was, I was my friend, you know. Uh, but as I got older, I realized he was my hero. Um, and I, I admired him and I respected him and I, in, in, in my own funny way, have carried that torch, uh, that he carried. He, like he passed me this baton. Um, and I have been like a, uh, a Pied Piper all over the country talking about Jackie Robinson. And in today's world, it's even more so because I point out more about what he did after baseball because most people read something. There's more books written about Jackie Robinson than any other figure ever. And um, everybody knows he was a baseball player and he broke the color line and that kind of thing. But I admire him for what he did after baseball. Uh, not necessarily just baseball, how he changed the world in his own way and worked so hard for it. Um, and that's become, that's where the heroism came to me. Um, and, of course, my dad was a hero of mine, um, who I respected so greatly. Um, and Jack Kennedy was another hero. So I had three heroes um Interestingly, one was Jack and one was Jackie. And then my dad, whose name is David. But, um, yeah, I was fortunate that way. Um, but I, I don't know if they became heroes until a little later on. You know what I mean? It, it's, yep. it, yeah. And it, hero it, it, is such a hard word to define. It means something right, right. different to all of us. And you can be a hero in one respect. We're talking off the air how everybody's human. They're gray. Sure. Uh, right. It's not a black and white thing. So, and when I think of Jackie, you, you think, well, he, he was this great guy and, and all this. Politically, he was a little messed up. And he, yeah, he, was. he admitted that, that he later admit. on. 
Right, he sure did. Um, to his credit, um, yeah. he found fault with um, some of the people he supported. Nixon, I think, was was one of them right. who disappointed him. Uh, it, right. it, it goes down the line. I of wonder course. who uh, um, Nixon was disappointed by. Uh, you know. Yeah. Who knows? It. Who knows? Um, yeah. Who does know? But <laughs> um, you know, he, heroes they say have clay feet. Uh, I don't know where that that expression comes to, comes from. I think it just comes from the fact that we're all human. And um, yeah, right. Right. And there you go. What did you read? Right. Um, I know um, um, Peter was uh, from a liberal family. Am I correct? Um, that's that's a difficult answer. In the in the in the beginning, when I was a very small child, my dad was a conservative in that he liked Eisenhower. Well, today he wouldn't be considered that, but let's forget about today. Let's go back to when I was a little boy. And uh, when I was a little boy, my father was a uh, I Like Ike guy. And he didn't like Adlai Stevenson. He liked, uh, he liked Eisenhower. Um, he became, after my mom died in 1963, my father was 60. I was like 16, 16 oh. and a half. Uh, ironically, my father went the other way. He started getting more and more liberal, oh. m- much more liberal. And uh, I remember him storming out of a party, storming out of a, storming out of a family barbecue because some guy – one of the people at the barbecue told a joke with the N-word in it. And my father made people move their cars and everything. He wouldn't stay in the same place with the guy. So he huh. came a long way, my father. So when you say I came from a liberal background, yeah, my father lived 23 more years. He lived from 60 to 83. And in those 23 years, he was, in fact, uh, a liberal and um, mm. progressive and uh as I well, I've, I've always been. Well, my whole life, my whole life, I've been liberal. I mean, when I was a boy, uh, just coming out of the little league, I loved John Kennedy. I yeah. mean, I didn't even know what I didn't even know what the hell I was talking about. Well, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about now either. But you know, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. I was always, I, I was always a proud JFK Democrat, and a, you yeah. know, like that. You know, and I. Yeah, we I, I remember I had a, when we were in junior high when that 1960 election <clears throat> was go, yeah. going down, yeah. and yeah. we yeah. were as impressionable <clears throat> at that age and open to change because um, it, it just we we could see it. It was a television thing for the first time. You could right. see the candidate. Right. You could see the looks <clears throat> on their face. And we wanted to be represented by John Kennedy. Right. We didn't, That's right. We didn't feel – you can't fool a kid. Kid, no. Um, there's no intellect there. It's just feelings and it's just uh, something. You know, there's ignorance. It's not that there's no intellect with a right. kid, but it's pure gut stuff. And yeah. he comes on and um, – uh, you know, we look back, maybe it was Camelot, but we were kids. We wanted Camelot. What's sure. wrong with being sure. a dreamer? What's, um, right, exactly. And, you know, it, the 50s um, were a generation where we were always worrying about ducking under the school um, desk because... Yes, right. The, the Russians were going to attack us, and this, that, right. and the other thing. It was a mindset where you would, and we didn't want that anymore. We saw that um, right. we bought into the, the idea that things were going to change. There was a young man with, with hope, you know, <clears throat> and we all attached to him. I mean, we really did. Right. It was, it was, 
you know, Eisenhower was a sickly man. He was an older man. Um, and here we got this young blood, this young, beautiful human being. Um, mm -hmm. And we all got excited by it. Yeah, a word that was affiliated with his both campaign and his whole era was the word vigor. Right. The I D O R. Everything was vigor. Right. Do this with vigor and vigor. And I, that caught that 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 struck a nerve in me. I I thought that was cool, like the new frontier and the and sure. the Peace Corps and the you know, it just. I said, you know what? This guy is cool because, you know, as as phony as politicians have to be to get where they have to get or want to get. I, you know, I just latched on to those things. I, I latched on to, um, he wanted to, he wanted to walk, on, he wanted a man to walk on the moon. And I, I said to myself, that's so outrageously great. I love it. No one, no one ever said that before. Exactly. That I heard, that I ever heard. And here's right. a grown man saying it and, and, and then with the Peace Corps and this and that, it just it struck a nerve, and it 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 resonated, and sure. I just that was the beginning of that, and then of right. course you know, I don't know, it just it just it grew, it. Um, there was of course, I said it. He used the words "dream" a lot, mm -hmm. and I was a daydreamer, and yeah. uh -huh. I loved dreaming. I still do sure. fantasizing right. and what of have course. you of how things could be better. That's all. Not mm -hmm. going to be perfect. We're not, uh, even then we knew everything wasn't going to be great. Right. But uh, we just wanted it to be better, and we always do one day at a time sometimes. Sure. Um, it's, it's a slow process, which brings us to the other subject we're going to talk about today, and that is reason number one why things, if you look look from 19, say, 58 to 2018, some 60, 70 years, whatever it is, why things haven't really been better. And, you know, if you could look at one institution besides, the, you know, organized religion or government or whatever, it would have to be the NRA. Right. And right. Um, this week we had something that um, brought hope to me. There were students in Parkland in Florida that have marched to Washington and are um, having their say with the President of the United States. Now, I watched just that, that today. He, yeah. Did you see me? it? Did you see it on, I, on in, what at the White House? It was no, amazing. I didn't. It was uh, amazing. Um, just that the man could uh, was open to communication with the kids um, right. uh, was heart, heartwarming uh, on some levels because let's face it, he's been cretinous, and right. um, if. And I don't know what it's going to take to to break through the NRA because they s literally support each and every Republican Party, uh, sure. uh, Republican congressmen uh, and women, both in the Senate and in, um, in, the in House, Congress. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just um, insurmountable. And I, I base that on the fact that Scalise, what's his name, the, the senator that was shot playing softball, shot in the hip. Right, yeah. And he doesn't want to bend on, on gun control. And how could people not see the, uh, I mean, you can keep your gun and we'll take the magazine. How about that? We just won't give you a gun that's a, a, a war weapon. You could have a rifle if you want to shoot clean it and have a great time and, you know, enjoy yourself. But um, how could these, how could our society have allowed, this is an open-ended question to both of you, how could this society have allowed 
war weapons, magazines, the, those bumpers or whatever they are to increase the amount of shells that can go off in, mm -hmm. in 15 seconds, they, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, how could that have been allowed? How could we have allowed an organization that spouts the Constitution and doesn't know how to read the word militia? And right. We've allowed that to happen. I, and I ask you guys for your expertise. Uh, where the do we go The answer, wrong? the short and simple answer, you've already mentioned, money. and that's the money. Money. Short and simple answer right. is money. I mean, if if, right. if the NRA, if you if you're a congressman, Ralph, and you don't have a pot to piss in, and you need money to run again, and an organization comes to you and says, "We'll give you four million dollars. Four million dollars we'll give you, so you can run. All we ask you is to uh, not hurt us." I won't hurt you at all. Just give me the four million dollars. That's beautiful. What don't you want me to hurt? Well, don't don't vote for anything that's going to tie our hands. You know, we're making a lot of money, we're selling a lot of uh, weapons, and if you start all over putting, the world. Uh, yeah, if you put the the uh, kibosh on that, we're not making that much money, and we're not going to give you four million dollars the next time you have to run in three years, or two years, sure. or whatever it is. And that this simple answer, that's what it is. And Here's a guy. Yes. Here's a guy who got shot playing softball, and he's just as steadfast as he was before. Or if he had never gotten shot, and the reason is for money because they, they, there's lists all over the internet on how much right. they each get. Now, who, knows, yeah. who knows? Who knows? It's like baseball. It's like baseball salaries. Who knows if if those numbers are right on the money? It doesn't matter if they're right on the money or not. They're getting big amounts, big large, money. big money, huge amounts of money from right. from the lobbyists, from, from from this lobby. The NRA is 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 stronger than uh, any any lobby. It, no, right. no lobby out the, no lobby out does it. it they right. just have money, 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 and they keep now throwing can... at these guys, and these guys get elected. And they vote for you know they 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 don't vote they they don't want to talk about it they don't want to they don't want to bring it up they don't want to you know the right. Parkland the park the, the local politicians at Parkland refused right. to start right. a you know dialogue. What they did? Peter, you know what they did? This was the state legislature of Florida that brought they brought up uh, a bill to ban assault uh, weapons and. All of the Republicans voted no. Right. And all of those Republicans were uh, voted by the, you know, the, the NRA grades these people. Yeah. Uh, A plus. By their support. They're all A's or A pluses. Right. And they all voted no. This is in Florida where this just terrible tragedy happened. Mm -hmm. See, but so, the thing is, Ronnie, the thing is, Ronnie, mm -hmm. you can put those statistics in those you can put them all over the internet. You can right. you can get on top of your house and scream them down to your neighborhood yeah, it or whatever. It wouldn't right matter. Letters. It doesn't matter. The no, thirty five percent the thirty five to forty percent of the people that are in his corner and you know who I mean by his, I'm not gonna mention yeah. his name. Yeah. The thirty five to forty percent of the people that are in his corner would not budge an inch. If you right. prove that he screwed six prostitutes while he was married, mm -hmm. that he had raped this girl or whatever, or if he if he hit his taxes, if he stole money from the IRS, if if if, if his businesses were all mafia run or whatever, it wouldn't make one bit of difference. It would be like a a a spit into the Atlantic Ocean. It wouldn't make a ripple. They don't care. They love this guy. They love him. And you can't say anything about him that's going to change any of their minds. It's just not going to happen. Right. It's, it's not, not going to happen. happen. They're steadfast in it. They really are. Oh, yeah. It's, they are. Uh, that's why I'm, not... I'm sometimes bemused by Facebook and the social media because we are basically preaching to our friends, to the choir. Yeah. 
uh, on right. these things. Both sides. I don't yes. hear of the the viral crap that goes on from the right wing because I don't befriend those people for the most part. Right. And the ones right. that I do befriend, uh, that I have an idea what their belief system is, uh, I let it fly sometimes be- because people are what they are and you get good from people in the- in different ways uh, until it gets to the point where something like this um, changes uh, changes us all. I want to know why it changed and come way sooner after Sandy Hook. For instance, this is the 18th major shooting in schools in this year. Why didn't things change at 17? Why was it this? Um... And who knows if it'll change now? Uh, well, I think it will. I really I have a think feeling it will, too. And you know what? It's yeah. the young people that are going after this thing. And it's like, if you aren't going to do anything about it, we're going to do something about it. And that's a tremendous, you know, thing. I think it's terrific. Uh, there's going to be on CNN tonight uh, a, a town meeting in Florida. Huh. There'll be it. Lots and lots of people there. And they're going to have a whole uh, town meeting on this thing. It should be very interesting. So how are you going to break a multi-billion dollar industry of weapons and armament? Yeah. Well, you know what their idea is? They want to, they want to uh, feel that all the teachers should have carry guns. <laughs> it's like selling more guns. They have more uh, would those teachers be armed with automatic weapons as well? I don't know. Uh, so how, how, effective, people? how effective can they be <laughs> right. with a gun that shoots, you know, One bullet six bullets, and their teachers, yeah. how good are they at handling that a weapon? <laughs> right. And do you want your teachers with a mindset of having to carry a weapon, and is that just feeding right into it? It's um, it, is that is just thinking along the lines of having having weapons anti peaceful enough to screw it all up. Um, uh, I don't agree with that. Let me ask you this. Yeah. You arm the teachers, or you arm some of the teachers, or you arm someone at the school with an automatic weapon. Okay. okay. Now, something goes down, something bad is starting to happen. Somebody comes in shooting or whatever, and the 911 call goes out to the police, man with a gun, man with a gun, shots fired. Here come the police. Now, this poor guy, this poor teacher's got an automatic weapon. He's going to get shot. Right, sure he Good point. Very good point. And how many uh, kids? It's, you can't fight the bad guy with the gun with the good no. guy with the gun no. because who the hell is the good guy? Right. <laughs> That's right. Um, and the NRA is, is supporting this because it'll sell more guns. It's disgusting. Right. Right. They're, that's right. why they're supporting Instead it. Of, how about just increasing the amount of time that it takes so they to buy a gun so they could do a background check on you. Yeah. How about right. having society aware of the cripples of the three legged dogs in this world that right. are struggling mentally? I'm sure this kid showed signs uh, of it uh, that were sure. blatantly ignored. They, they um, missed it. They it missed it exactly. His, they had parents they had done a lot of things. The eye of the camera and say. We had no idea of this. We had no idea of that. I can't believe But they did have an idea. I I raised a kid, and the kid had a foster brother. And I knew their moods um, instantly. I mean, um, so that's something that, for whatever reason, I imagine what the reason is, they are hiding. But how about the neighbors? How about the... The reason he was thrown out of school, don't they follow the kid if he's thrown out of school to see well, what happens? You know what? 
you know what? The parents, the so, not, not, they're not really the blood parents. The the couple that have another son and this kid Cruz right. was living with them. They were being interviewed today live on um, Dr. Phil, and my wife was watching it, and I was in here with the dog, and we both watched them being interviewed. And Dr. Phil said, well, why was, why was uh, Nicholas, is that his name, Nicholas? I think so. I mean, why was Nicholas thrown out of school? And the mother goes, oh, he was fighting. He was thrown out for fighting. Okay. Any follow-up on that? No, I just took his word for it that he was thrown out for fighting. I looked at Linda. Linda looked at me and said, "What? Say what?" And then, and then Dr. Phil said, "Did he? Did he? Did he show any of these? Uh, you know, was he a little bit strange or weird or? No, he's perfectly, perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah. Then they, then, then they talked to the neighborhood kids. That were, some of them, a couple of them were in the audience." And one friend he had from uh, middle school or since sixth grade, he said, no, he used, to, he used to throw things at people. He used to get in fights all the time. He used to pull girls' hair. He used to uh, – all of these stories about these things. And these people missed all of that? No. They, when a commercial came, Linda says, how could they miss all that? I said, they didn't miss it. They're lying, and why sure. would they lie? Why sure. would they lie? Because they don't want to get, they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want right. to get in trouble, because right. if they look admit, bad, look bad on TV or exactly, sure. and, and Ralph be arrested as an accomplice. Could be, could be, you know, because they they would say, well, I I knew I saw him cleaning the gun the night before, blah 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 blah, but whatever, you know. Yeah, you know, so so they just lie the other way. I mean, it was so ridiculous. Part two, part two is on tomorrow. Uh, they're going to talk to kids that knew them and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. I already put it on my DVR. Speaking of already. Dr. Phil, you know what I found out? Dr. Phil is a foot doctor, and I'm not taking really? away anything. Huh. Yeah, really. But, um, that's his, that's that. what he got a doctorate in. Uh, that's what he became a doctor for. He's a not psychologist. He's a no, no. no he, he's a good, uh, just like Judge Judy. I don't think she's a yeah. judge. I don't yeah, think she know. is. But uh, I don't think she's, Russ, she's a piece of work too. She's yeah. a piece right. of work. So so is Doctor <laughs> Phil. But I'm just saying what I saw. This couple yeah. actually sat there for the whole show and denied sure. ever seeing any right. signs whatsoever. Right. That this kid displayed that were negative or anything. Oh, no, he was exactly. nice. Exactly. You exactly. know, he he did his homework. He did, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's so full of shit. And so, did they go down when he was suspended for fighting? Did they find out what the fight was about? What? It couldn't have been the that. first time. You don't get. The kid, you don't the have kid is where they have video of the kid shooting his gun in the backyard. Another gun. Not that gun that he used. Shooting a right. gun in the backyard, wearing a Make America Great cap, red and white cap, a Trump cap. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Yep. wow, indeed. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. imagine if he had an Obama cap on, and this was five years ago. Yeah. Imagine if this kid had an Obama cap on. Yeah. What the Republicans in Congress would be screaming and howling about. Oh, my God. Oh Impeach him! Oh, yeah. So good. Throw yeah. them all in jail. They're all. They're all. It's all Hillary's fault. You know. Yeah, emails. Right. Emails. Benghazi. I mean, it's, it's so, so unbelievable. Bad. It's just you know, it's oh. to a point now. It's when horrible. I saw this, it's it just it just underlined it for me when I saw right. Doctor Phil today. I am so happy that I have not watched one news program nor bought a newspaper since November of 2016. When this clown was elected, I shut it down. Completely yeah, yeah. shut it down. The only news I get is on Facebook, and when I log on to AOL, the headlines come up. I know nothing about anything, and I don't want to know. But it's just, Watch it's just, to me, when I saw this kid shooting his gun with a Make America Great hat again on, I said, no one's making, no one's going crazy over that. 
No Democrats are going completely bonkers over that. If this kid had well, an know, Obama you can't, hat, fight Repub- you can't fight Republicanism with Democrat with Democrats. That's mm-hmm. just the, the way it is. Yeah. For one reason or another, these two parties have been playing good guy, bad guy, good cop, yeah. bad cop with us every four years since I'm a kid. And mm-hmm. um, it's pretty much, you know, stop, stop the lines, change the labels, and you start up again. It's pretty much the same. I mean, Trump notwithstanding... But Trump doesn't come alone. He's got Pence behind him right. and Ryan behind him. And McConnell. you got some Democrats who sh- should be taking the opportunity to stand up in Congress and right. tell the country what it's really about. Say, right. look, I'm a Democrat. I'm not going to run again. This is bullshit. But let me tell you why it's bullshit. And expose what's going on. You're going to be seeing uh, that. Sure. You think so? You think so? Yeah, I do. I do. In fact, okay. it's not only going to be Democrats. It's going to be people like Kasich and Romney. Oh, Kasich. Yeah. And yeah. Bush. People like that. They're they're going to start standing up now, and they're going to say, "Enough is enough. This guy is is uh, no. He, he's he's death to the country. He, he's killing the country." You know, yeah, you see, something's got to give. There was a tremendous editorial today in the New York Times by Tom Friedman, who I absolutely yeah. love. He happens to be from St. Louis Park, Minnesota. That's where I, I, Tom I live. Friedman. And uh, he, he's terrific. Uh, I posted it on Facebook today, so you might want to read it. He really oh, leaves it all out. Oh, that. Tom Friedman, you what's, the es- what's the essence of it, Ron? The essence is that uh, that he's giving, giving away the country that he's being black boy, blackmailed by the Russians for whatever reason, and uh, he's not standing up to them because he's afraid of some of the things that might come out, and uh, he's like a puppet to Putin. Pretty scary. So this is treasonous, basically. It is, of course, it is. Yeah. I read something. I read something yesterday that a president can only commit treason during war. Oh, really? War, oh, we got twelve war. wars going on. No problem. We'll line them up. <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. so if you want another one? He'll start one, and he'll. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just, just give him ten How's... minutes. He's eating. Listen, <laughs> gentlemen. Would you be angry with me if I changed the subject? Oh, I'd be delighted at this point. <laughs> okay, great. I thought so. Um, before we leave the airwaves tonight, I thought maybe we could talk briefly about books that we've read that are non-sports or specifically non-baseball books that we've enjoyed uh, throughout our lives. How about Maybe even we'll take you? one step? Books that we read when we were kids back in the day we're talking about that helped form our lives. Okay. How about that? Nonfiction right. books that formed our lives. Start with you, Ronnie. Uh, I didn't read a lot when I was a kid. I was <laughs> I read it was all baseball. It was all baseball books. <laughs> well, um, as I've gotten older, I love to read. And a lot of the books that I'm reading today are books, uh, are biographies of uh, some of my heroes. Uh, I'm just reading right now a book by Chris Matthews about Bobby Kennedy. It's fascinating. I can't put it down. Um, things like that. So okay. not, not sport related, but uh, people that I admire getting some insight stories about it. All right. So. Let me pitch in a little bit and tell you about a, um, a couple of books by a man named Robert Rimmer that okay. changed my life. Um, one was The Rebellion of Yale Merritt, and uh, I 
I can't think. There was another one that was a big seller right, um, right off off the bat, and it basically got into alternative lifestyles that um, everything for everybody wasn't just one mate, one closed relationship. Um, there were people that were sharing their lives with more than one partner, more than one couple sharing their lives, that sort of thing. And um, led me to um, an open mind, and as I went through life, as um, things became interesting at one time or another. Not necessarily <laughs> better, but just interesting. And... Um, tumultuous perhaps at times but um i want to be just like you when i grow up (laughs) pardon me i want to be just like you when i grow up oh uh, how you're never going to grow up that's (laughs) right think of it in those terms the three of us are never going to grow up because no in the traditional sense when you grow up you become staid and right. the only thing I'm glad about growing up and reading all all these uh, books as a kid and forming, you know, any time there was a controversial book, I'd read it. I remember my parents tried to keep me from Peyton Place. They were reading reading <laughs> that book, and they hide. Oh, I read that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As, or Valley of the Dolls was another one that uh, that might have come, come a few. Jackie times. Collins. Yeah, Jackie. Yeah. I'd like to read. I'd like to read the gist of what was really going on. Um, uh, there was, I remember reading a book and a series of books by William Goldman. He wrote oh, The yeah. Thing of It Is and Boys and Girls Together and. Um, those were novels that taught me a lot about life. Didn't he write so, uh, uh, The Princess Bride? Uh, was William that Golden? William? Yes, it might might have been. Fantastic um, book. Some of the lines were in yeah. red ink. <laughs> yes. Some of the lines in the book were in red ink that he wanted to really punch home. Right. If I'm not mistaken, I might have, you know, when I hang up and I look this up and it's not William Golden. Golding, uh, was I'm going to be two, very... Two, but two guys, William Golding, who wrote um, uh, the book about the the kids that were out out there. Lord of the Flies? Lord of the Flies, right. But uh-huh. William Goldman wrote, um, uh, as I say, Boys and Girls Together and right. The Thing of It Is and... Um, he was just a, a tremendous writer. He wrote a police story, too, that um, sticks in my head. But I loved reading as a kid. I did, like you, Ronnie, read a lot of baseball stuff, too. Yes. And right. I was lucky yeah. enough to come across the biography of Jackie Robinson so I sure. could combine school with doing a book report on Jackie I, by the – Third time I did a book report on Jackie Robinson, I had that thing down. <laughs> I was that's something. Al Campanus and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many kids have called me uh, over the years uh, wanting to interview me because they're doing a, a report on Jackie Robinson. It's mm-hmm. just amazing. I've got a kid I'm meeting with on, on this Saturday who called me, who wants to talk about Jackie Robinson. It's amazing. Kids got moxie. That yeah, kid, whoever it is, is going to be a success in life. He's curious, and he's mm-hmm. not afraid to reach out. And not only that, he knows how to re- who to reach out to. Mm-hmm. So, right. Um, right. you know what would be nice? Why don't you have him, when, when you get with him, why don't you invite uh-huh. him as a, a guest on our show so we could find out what young people are thinking a little bit more. How would I do that? It, I mean, I'm meeting him Saturday afternoon. Well, could we do if a show? You talk to him and ask him if you get along. You can ask him, yeah. would you like to be
be a guest on, on a podcast that I do. Huh. Okay. That's and, okay. And he's How old is the kid, Ronnie? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll find out when I meet him. It's actually a girl. Um, okay. Yeah. She's probably in, in junior high or something, I would guess. Mm-hmm. You guys were well, reading a lot of books. I say I'm going to encourage this relationship, but go for it, Ronnie. <laughs> you, were, you, you, you were reading a lot of books when you were young. I was reading a lot of magazines, like Playboy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the same author, uh, ironically, Playboy gets a bad rap by a lot of They had some very good articles. Uh, terrific articles. The Updike, the John Updike that I refer to was a regular yeah. short story writer in mm-hmm. in Playboy. Uh, yeah. Woody Allen uh, wrote in Playboy. Gene Shepard wrote a lot. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he wrote Christmas Story and he um, tremendously articulate uh, talk show guy in New York when we were growing up. Um, I That's where I'm at. The great 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 great. We get a lot in Playboy, in the, um, and I'm and sure I that's like why the you were that didn't have any words. So, I, I take your word for it. That's why you were reading the magazine. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Esquire magazine had a great had great authors write for them. Norman Mailer wrote a lot for Esquire magazine. Yes, and I'll tell you what other what other publication had great writers for about a decade. I don't know about nowadays, and I don't know about the very beginning, but certainly in the middle, Rolling Stone, they would have great authors, great writing in there. Some Hunter great Anderson. articles, yeah. Oh, really, really we good. New York, Groundbreaking we had the articles. Voice. We had the yeah. Village Voice, yeah. which was as liberal and as progressive <laughs> a rag as yeah. was out there. And I, I used to read that when I go to New York. Yeah. The Village Voice. That's right. Ronnie, you can't imagine how many how many daily papers did you have in where you grew up in your your. Oh, well, we had one in Sheboygan, but my dad used Sheboygan. to get the Milwaukee Journal and the Milwaukee Sentinel, so there were two okay. papers. Okay, so two in Milwaukee and one yeah. in Sheboygan. In Sheboygan, right? Peter, was it twelve or fifteen? <laughs> Twelve daily newspapers. Twelve daily newspapers in New York City. No kidding. Yeah, twelve. Twelve of them. Some and some came out in the morning. Today? Some came out in the afternoon. Yeah, that's right. And how many today? Three or four. Yeah. Yeah. I figure. Yeah. That. Yeah. Uh, do you still read? Do you guys still read? Um, newspapers that are paper. I do. Get your news I do. I have it delivered every Not day. Not November. Not every November. day to my door. Yeah. Uh, I do. do you, I stopped, uh, you I stopped the New York Times. Any news through the, okay. All right. I was just going to say, um, I you're too well informed not to be getting your news. Like you say, the only way you get it is on Facebook and on AOL and what have you. Yeah, but when I log on. you to audit. They're leading you through the headlines to articles that I know you must follow up on, just because of your natural curiosity. Well, yeah. it depends. Yeah, you're right about that. You're right about that. Um, yeah. But I, I read about one one hundredth what I used to read uh, mm-hmm. politically and, and and on the news. I don't know anything. That, you know, I'll, I'll go out for pizza and I'll meet somebody in it. Hey, how about that thing? And, and blah blah blah. And I don't even know what he's talking about. And there's this big story on the news or something. Like that. I, I have no clue. He looks at me like I'm, uh, you know, something wrong with me. That's Just how I am but, with pop culture. I have no idea who any uh, of these people are. It's on I don't either. I don't either. I mean, um, and it's a joy not not to have any idea. Sometimes I quit <laughs> watching the Grammys because I didn't know anybody. <laughs> hey, Ralph, you ever read Philip Roth? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I uh, still I can't look at a piece of liver without thinking of him. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Philip Roth graduated from the high school I taught at. Of course, really? way before I got Jersey, there. As did, 
a woman that uh, writes crossword puzzles for the New York Times, who was okay. huh. a schoolmate of his at that high school, and uh, her name is Norma Fisher. Okay. And if you um, Google her, you'll see a lot of New York Times mm-hmm. um, crossword puzzles that she's written over the years. She's uh, cool. a championship Scrabble player, very bright woman. Um, yeah. Peter, how long? How have memories of her. You? If you're listening, Norma, I think of you every now and again. <laughs> uh, Peter, Philip Roth graduated. Philip Roth graduated. Why would? Philip, why hasn't he blacked the thoughts by now? You would be thinking, but no, it's impossible. Um, <laughs> yes, no, maybe Norma. Good luck to you. I hope you're doing very well. Um, Peter, how many years did you teach? 35 years at the same school. High school? I got there in 19... uh, Yes, I got there in 1968, and Uh I retired in 2003. Philip Roth graduated in 1951 from that school. And what did you teach? Human sexuality. (laughs) Really? Those who can do. Those who can't teach. I guess... Peter, it's incredible. I guest lectured on um, at a woman whom I know in San Francisco. She taught a class in human sexuality, and um, I guest lectured, and my talk was on hedon- responsible hedonism. Mm. So um, oh. I, uh, you're doing great work. And Mr. Kinsey salutes you. I, I, got, to meet, um, I got to meet uh, Wardell Palmer, Pomeroy, uh, on several occasions um, over the years, who co-wrote the Kinsey book. And um, one of the authors that we talked about, if I'm not mistaken, Rimmer, wrote a book that um uh and it was a, it was a movie too uh fictionalizing how the research was done for the Kinsey report it was a mm. very interesting book and i learned wow. a lot about sexuality and what um what life was about by reading that book so isn't it great for the written word yes yeah. Okay, guys. Um, I don't know if this we're been fun. winding down. I think we're winding I'm, down. Before we shut yeah. it down, before we shut it down, <laughs> let me give not only our audience, but let me give you two guys. Uh, I just I, I want before before I hang up before we get out of here. I I was thinking about the books that really, really made it, I'm not going to say changed my life because that's, that's overboard, but books that really got me uh, thinking, I mean really, really thinking, got my brain moving, like working out for, for uh, going out for the Olympics, like you know how you, you work out for a, bot- we, we had the, Jack O'Halloran on, and he told us how he used to work out before a fight, and guys who work out before the Olympics, and guys who work out before a marathon. Well, this will work your mind out like that. If you've ever heard of a fellow named Saul Bellow, I didn't yes, know to yes, rhyme yes. his name, B-E-L-L-O-W. Saul Bellow, he lived, yeah, that's right. He lived from 1915 to 2005. He wrote... Uh, a great number of books, a great number of books, but he wrote four or five novels that both of you should read if you haven't read them yet, or if you have read them, great, because I I know you're going to agree with me. These are the best books I ever read in my life, and they are in no no way, shape, or form in uh, order of preference, but I'll just name them. 
The Adventures of Augie March, 1953, Henderson the Rain King, 1959, Herzog, 1964, Humboldt's Gift, 1975, and Ravelstein, 2000. Now, he, Saul Bellow lived most of his life, not all of it, most of his life, he was born in the Bronx, lived most of his life in Chicago because he taught at the University of Chicago. And uh, later he moved somewhere else, but the bulk of his life was in Chicago, and it was in the bad section of Chicago to keep him on his toes and keep him writing. He didn't live in a mansion anywhere, although he was a millionaire, because he won the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Prize in the same year, 1976. I mean, the guy, his, his fiction was filled with larger-than-life figures, as was Dickens and Balzac. This guy, if you've never read Saul Bellow, go to your library, get out these four or five books, mm-hmm. read them, and if you, if you don't want to go to a library, go on Amazon and get them for like a dollar each or whatever. They're just incredible. He is, well, Martin Amos called him the greatest American writer in history, period. Whoa. Okay. I, I'm aware of him. I'm aware of him. This guy, I was this aware guy, of heavy. Herzog. I think, think Herzog was his, the number one his number one bestseller, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it was. Mm-hmm. I think it was, too. Yep. And we joked about Philip Roth and, and uh, Portnoy's complaint I was referring mm-hmm. to with the liver. Yeah. He was also very, very prolific. He wrote a book that sticks with me. It's called When She Was Good. Huh. And that um, that's just something from... Uh, from the back of my mind, from when I was a kid, that really influenced me and uh, and taught me and prepared prepared me. Yep. yep. How about let's each of us? We've talked about nonfiction books, non baseball books when we were a kid. One book when you were a kid that was a baseball book. There was a nonfiction baseball book. Start with oh, the- nonfiction. Yeah, real book. Baseball. It would have to be a biography. Would yeah. be a biography, I guess. I guess ba- something about Babe Ruth. I don't know. So many books were written about Babe Ruth, but I did read a biography of Babe Ruth back, 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 way back. Okay. And uh, it was cool. As How that. about you, Ronnie? Anything about I baseball? Read book, that, uh, I read a book about that really Besides Jackie. Be- yeah. Besides Jackie? Yeah. yeah I re- about Gil Hodges. All the Dodger guys, you know, any books that came out. I would read them. All right. Well, I'll throw in. I read Vec is in Wreck. If I had. Oh, good one. That was uh-huh. a good one uh, that I that I read. I also read thing. I, I read something by Joe Garagiola. Yes. Who, I was just going to say uh, that. Baseball's a funny baseball's game. a funny game, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I enjoyed that. Um, and but Arnold Hanno. Oh, yes. You know, uh, were you bleak? on with me when I had Arnold? No, Arno? I wish I were. Uh, and ironically, I picked up that book, A Day in the Bleachers, signed to some other guy, um, a guy named Tom from Arnold Hanno, in a used bookstore very recently, and I'm uh, in the midst of rereading that and as a matter of fact, he brings something up that I'll ask you two Dodger fans about. Okay. He talks about Davy Williams getting short shrift in those days. He was a terrific fielder. And he mentioned specifically when Gilliam was a, in, um, in the early years, when Gilliam, I don't remember his rookie year, but he's talking a day in the bleachers in 54. He said that Junior Gilliam had trouble making the pivot at second base. And I wonder why that's why he moved to third and later left and and what have you. Did you guys know know that? or? Um, I never knew that. I just knew that they had to make room for Jackie. And, uh, you know, they, they put Jackie at second. 
Yeah. And they put Gilliam right, third. Didn't Gilliam they? came. Third. Gilliam came later, and uh, I respect that man incredibly. I mean, yes, incredibly versatile. I just, I don't know why I flashed on that. Um, they were talking about he was, he was talking was Hano about um, players and their reputation and what have you. Okay, but. Um, it always, it always comes back to baseball, guys, doesn't it? I would like to mention one, though, that, that it happened. Uh, Orlando Sopita, is, uh, he fell at a very bad fall. Yes, he, he, uh, uh, yes. He's unconscious. Terrible. He's 80 years old, and he's in a hospital, so let's all say yeah, a prayer for him. in critical condition. They say he yeah. has cardiac problems now. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Did, did he fall? Or was it the cardiac problems that... That I didn't read. I just read the headline, Orlando Cepeda, yeah. critical condition, cardiac problem. Yeah, that's terrible. Too bad. Absolutely. It's too bad. He was a good man. A um, good man. Still is. Let's not count him out. That's right. Let's not count him out yet. That's right. All right. That's right. Hey, thanks, guys. This, this is Hey, listen, we, thank you very much, both of you. Oh, Thank you very much, and I'll get back to you guys. guys. And, um, uh, I think we're giving folks an idea of what 70-year-old men remember in a much simpler time. <laughs> right, and exactly. It, yep. And in a time, even though it was much simpler, it wasn't that all that simple. No. No, it was not. We thought it was simple because we were young. We thought it was simple. That's right. What we didn't have to pay the bills. That's right. Oh, right. We didn't have to do anything yeah. but play in the schoolyard. There you go. That's and right. So all we had to do. Yeah. And we managed not to get thrown out of school, too. And if we did, somebody That's would right. have picked up and said, what's wrong? That's you know? right. That's right. It doesn't That's right. Yeah, we've come a long way, haven't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, it was a simple little question. May I ask you, how come you got thrown out of school? <laughs> Maybe I'll go up and talk to the teacher. How about the counselor? How about this, that? You know, just be inquisitive. That's a, you know, watch after your kids. That's a, That's right. all we have is our future. What a, That's what right. A, That's what, our future. Right. Um, exactly. What, what has this turned into? Uh, we asked. This has been great. Turned uh, into another uh, show. Ronnie Rubinovich yeah, and Ralph Tycho. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank thanks you, guys. Thanks. Thank, thanks to, you're very welcome. Thank you for our listening audience. Hope you enjoy the show. We'll be back next week. Gentlemen, be good. Bye-bye. Well, bye-bye.